your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Hello, everyone. This is Monica Dennington, and welcome to TikTok Live. Happy Thursday. I'm very glad that you decided to join us this week. I want to say hello to all of you new people. We're very glad to see you. We want you to go on the chat and say hi and, um, you know, just get to know you a little bit. Also, I want you guys to pull up your Twitters, um, pull up your, uh, your Facebook accounts, or you can use that Facebook share on uh, TikTok.tv because um, we're going to be uh, typing out a little message and sending our synchronized tweet. If you guys don't know what that is, uh, we just all send out a tweet at the same time to invite our friends to come and join us so that we can enjoy their company um, on Thursday nights for TikTok Live. So just type out a little message and, and uh, let them know that you're here and that we're having a great time in the Word and invite them to come and join us. And we'll do that synchronized tweet here in just a minute. I'll give you a chance to type that out while I do some announcements. And um, we are going to be having um, some changes, as I told you last week, and um, some changes this um, next month. Um, all very good, very exciting things. You know, we have uh, talked to you about the ads. Um, there are some ads on um, on the broadcast that we don't appreciate um, because the content is not, you know, wholesome. And um, we've been doing what we can, uh, working with live stream to do what we can to influence those, the content of those. However, um, we are also going to be offering an ad-free broadcast of TikTok Live starting next Thursday, okay? So um, we are um, going to be going to a situation where um, you need to register um, just, you know, your email address. You're going to put that in and register, and it's free registration, okay? And that's going to enable you um, to come on and join in the chat next week. So whenever you see that, I know that's a new thing, but this is um, something that we're implementing in order to offer um, just a better environment all around for everyone. So I want to encourage you to go that direction and go ahead and register whenever you see that next week and um, that again that is free registration it is still a free broadcast TikTok live will always be a free broadcast but um, it's going to uh, enable us to just give you a better viewing experience okay so um, we want you guys to sign up for the TikTok TV Twitter and also um, join us on Facebook Monica Dennington on Facebook um, and you will be um, kept up to date on all that stuff, um, and you know, then you'll be able to know what to do whenever it's time to register for next week's um, broadcast. Uh, you'll get all that information in your feed, and you click through and do that, and um, then you'll be able to join us and chat as well. Okay, so um, we look forward to uh, seeing how that goes next week. We're also going to be um, doing some simulcasting this month on Ustream. Really looking forward to that, and again, we'll keep you guys posted on that um, hopefully that will uh, will bring in we know that will bring in some new viewers but it will allow us to spread the gospel even further out there into cyberspace so um, keep your eyes open for that I also have a very important and exciting announcement, which I told you guys about last week, but I couldn't tell you what it was. Well, I do have a little more information for you about that this week, and that is the fact that we are going to be having a conference in Dallas, Texas, on October 15th and 16th. That's right, a live, actual, in-person conference. We're going to have worship, we're going to have Christian music artists, and I will be teaching the Word of God. So we want you guys to be the first to know. Um, we are putting up the registration site this week, but we want to announce it to you so you guys can put it on your calendar and plan on coming to Dallas, Texas, so that I can finally meet you and uh, see you in person and so that you can um, come into fellowship, not just online, but actually in person with some of these people that you've gotten to know online and other TikTok uh, viewers that you don't know as well as we have sites and communities all over the place um, and it's going to be great to see some of those people coming together. I will tell you that one of the reasons we wanted to um, announce this to you all first is because of the fact that there is extremely limited seating. We know that um, there will be limited seating 
and we um, want you guys to go ahead and reserve your seats now um, before, uh, you know, the, the rush of feet that will be coming this way to come to this conference, obviously. <laughs> so, but uh, seriously, though, um, we, we don't know exactly how many, but we do know that it will be limited. So please take the opportunity when it comes across your Twitter feed, when it comes across your Facebook, you need to go there and register as soon as you can, okay, to reserve your seat. And I am really looking forward to that, you guys. Um, we'll have more information coming to you in the weeks to come on that. So, okay, um, I think that's all that I have for announcements, and um, we're going to pray together, and then we're going to get to the teaching. Dear Lord Jesus, we come together, we come here to glorify you, we love you, we are in love with you, we are your bride, and we have one purpose in being here tonight, and that is to glorify you, to let you know that we are available for you to make us and mold us, to form us, Lord God, into what you want us to be, to make us holy as you are holy. So tonight, I pray for all the people um, that are listening, that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear, that they would not be blinded by the enemy, that they would not stop up their ears if they hear something hard, but instead that you would give us courage as the body of Christ to hear the words that you uh, speak to us, that show us the reality of our situation, and also to implement those things in our lives so that your power can be at work in our lives to free us from sin and to free the people around us from sin as well, Lord God, and to make us a powerful witness and a light um, in these dark times, Lord God. Uh, fill us with your wisdom tonight and just know that we love you and um, just help us to love each other in the way that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, tonight we are going to be talking about how to defeat Satan. The title tonight is Hit Me With Your Best Shot, right? That's what Jesus did whenever he died on the cross and he was raised from the dead. He took Satan's best shot. And um, what we're going to do tonight in order to find out how we are going to defeat Satan in our lives, because, you know, a lot of us, um, probably all of us, um, are dealing with uh, sin issues that it's a little bit frustrating sometimes because some some issues, you know, you get victory over, it, it comes quick, it, it's a clean and fast cut, and then sometimes it's like, you know, you're dealing with, with things in your life, whether it's sin or sickness or poverty or all the different problems that come in your family or whatever, and it just feels like Satan's defeating you, you know, on all these different fronts. And we're going to find out what victory is and how we get that victory by looking at the way that Jesus got victory over Satan, okay? So, we're going to start out um, tonight, again, just looking at the fact that Jesus is the ultimate victor, okay? Now, there was a question um, that, that started in the Garden of Eden. And <clears throat> um, that question, actually, it started before the Garden of Eden. It started whenever iniquity was found in Satan. Um, and uh, when iniquity was found in Satan, um, Satan was an, ar uh, an archangel, uh, angel, and he was um, a cherubim. He was beautiful. God made him beautiful. He gave him great authority. Um, so, you know, he was, he was um, created uh, by God and loved by God and had, you know, special, a special place in God's kingdom. So it was a big deal when he decided to turn against God. That's, that's betrayal. You know, that's, it's a horrible thing. But it was insidious, and it was insidious enough that whatever, whatever this iniquity, this strange thing that was found in him, this rebellion um, that had never, you know, been an issue in God's kingdom that we know of before, it was so um, insidious and such a strong weapon that it brought down a third of the angels, okay? Satan not only rebelled against God himself and said, I will ascend to the heights, I will take God's throne, he didn't stop there. But um, what we're going to find out tonight is that the nature of this iniquity or sin that was found in Satan, the nature of it is that it's infectious. And we see that in the fact that um, this, um, this iniquity was spread in heaven and there was a great war in heaven and a third of the angels were cast down. They, they rebelled against God and those who stayed with God cast them down um, to the earth and they were, um, you know, they, they don't have as much power obviously, but um, the tragedy is, and this is what we got to understand, you guys. 
the tragedy is that God loves all of his creation, okay? And that's the insidious thing about sin is that it works its way into God's family, into your family, into the households and the kingdoms that we love. It works its way into those places and it corrupts them from the inside out. It divides one member um, from another so that it tears the household apart. It tears the kingdom apart, limb from limb, sinew from sinew, and it causes rot and death and decay. That is the nature of sin and what it works um, in us, okay, and in, in, in anything, um, whether it's in angels or humans. That's the nature of sin. So it's an insidious foe, okay? And understand um, that there is actually a question in heaven, apparently, according to the scriptures, about whether or not this foe can be defeated. Now, that may seem kind of strange because everybody knows that God's more powerful than anybody else, and that's true. God can smash anybody that he wants to smash, he is, um, you know, more powerful than anyone. He can, he can burn a city to the ground with one word. He can burn, uh, it says that at some point he's going to roll up the sky like a scroll and burn the entire earth with fire and make everything new. So everybody knows that God can do anything that he wants to. But here's the deal. It's not God's will to smash and destroy everything that he's made because he loves the people that he's made. Okay? So... When Satan comes in and corrupts the people that God loves with sin, God's solution is not to smash them, okay? That's not a solution to God any more than it would be a solution to you to lose a member of your family to addiction or to, you know, any other self-destructive thing. It's not acceptable to lose that person because they're irreplaceable. We're not just talking about, you know, houses or cars or kingdoms. We're talking about family members, okay, people that are important to God, okay? So it's not a solution to just take by might and by power and just smash everything that's evil, okay? Because that evil has taken captive people that God loves. So I want to show you, um, we're going to start out, I was actually planning on starting somewhere else, but that's okay. We'll go here. We're going to uh, start out by looking at a scripture in Ephesians about... Um, about this question in the universe about, okay, how can we beat this thing, this sin, you know, this weird thing that was found in Satan, um, even though God is more powerful, what difference does it make if Satan can come in and just corrupt everything? Okay, and uh, to show you how, how infectious this is, um, we're going to go to Genesis here in just a second and see how this whole thing started in humankind. It started with one little morsel of gossip. That is how the fall of man happened. One little conversation that Satan had with a human being that planted doubt in their heart about God. That's how insidious it is. And I want to read to you Ephesians 3, 10 through 11. Um, it tells us that God's purpose in the church here, okay? And it says um, his intent or God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so what he is doing here on, on this planet, in the human beings that, you know, you're a human being and all the people that you know, we um, have a destiny that is far beyond the scope of what we see in our individual lives. Okay, God has a purpose through his people, which is the church. And his purpose is that he is showing, he is going to show his manifold wisdom and make it known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Okay, think about it. Why would it be necessary for God to make his wisdom known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms? Yeah, there are other players here, you guys. It's not just us, okay? Everybody's standing around and watching this. This, this thing, this, this epic uh, story that is being played out for them, that God is playing out for them on planet Earth to show them something, that his manifold wisdom reigns. If you look at what has happened, you guys, you can understand why there's a question as to whether or not this wisdom um, is, is going to be strong enough to defeat the enemies of God, okay? Everybody knows God's stronger, but, but the question is how can we you know, not lose the things that, that God cares about in the process, right? Let me show you um, what happened in the garden. Let's just read real quick about um, that conversation, that insidious conversation 
that Satan had with Eve, okay? Satan came in the form of the serpent, and it said, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from so we most of us know the rest of the story if you don't you can read it in Genesis chapter 3 but God goes on to tell them what the consequences of their sin is going to be and one of those consequences was that they were cast away from God's presence you know they were cast out of the garden of Eden they couldn't be in his holy presence because they were sinful now God did make provision to cover their sin um, to cover their sinfulness by uh, providing them with clothes of animal skins okay so he had to kill an animal in order to do that but still they were cut off from God's presence and that is what is known as the fall of man now I want you to notice what um, started this whole thing, okay? It wasn't a sword. It wasn't, you know, um, a, a great revolution, right? It was one little insidious conversation, a, just a few lies that Satan planted in a human heart about God. Okay, now this um, is what we call gossip, okay? When you talk bad about somebody... And this, this applies um, to people, it, it applies to um, God, you know, whoever you're gossiping about. I'm going to read to you a couple of scripture verses about gossip. The nature of gossip. This is what Satan did. He planted doubts in Eve's mind about God's character. First of all, he questioned what God said, so tried to plant confusion. And um, he said, did, did God really say you can't eat from any of these trees? Well, Eve said, well, he said, we can eat from the trees, but we just can't eat from that one. So you see, he started out with confusion. And then he went on to lie um, to Eve about the consequences of eating that fruit and to lie to her about God's motivations for not wanting her to eat it. He tried to convince her that, um, you know, God was only telling her she was going to die because he knew that Eve would be like God, you know, if she ate from it. So he tempted her with the desire to be as great as God, as wise as God. And um, he also planted something in her heart which is called doubt. Okay, because up until that point, she was innocent, that she and Adam were naked. They trusted in God for everything and never even entered their mind not to trust God. But in that moment, a mistrust of God was planted in their heart. And that was the beginning of that unraveling that we we're talking about. Okay, that's that insidious sin. So notice that this was not done with a sword or an army. It was done with a word. It was done with a short conversation that planted doubt in their minds about God. Okay, so understand um, gossip. Let me read to you about gossip. Proverbs 18. Eight says the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost parts. Okay, and then it says, as surely as a north wind brings rain, so a gossiping tongue causes anger. So <clears throat> the words of a gossip, they go down to your inmost parts. And if you just think about it, the second that you hear anything bad about a person, this is how insidious this is. You can know a person for a long time, okay? Know their character. But if you have somebody come up to you, for example, and say, you know, your friend over here, um, they, they are actually a kleptomaniac. I would hate to tell you, but they're a kleptomaniac. And so, you know, I'll just, I'll just be aware of that, okay? You can, you can have known that person for a long time, know that they have good character, know that they would never steal anything. But... Once that person puts that thought in your mind, it's going to be there. And you're probably going to watch your purse just a little bit closer when that person's around. Okay? You're probably, when you look at them, 
it's going to come into your mind. You're going to wonder about it. When you're in a store with them, you're going to be kind of watching them to see if they're going to take anything. You know, it's in your mind. And even if you tell yourself, no, I don't believe that, it's still there. It's like choice morsels. It goes down to the very marrow of a man. It's insidious. So why does God need to show the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms? Why does he need to show his wisdom to them? Because the question is, how can you beat this sin? All it takes is one little word. You know, I mean, do we just take the, the, the iniquity? Do we just take the person who's planting these things and we just hide them off in some dark corner of the universe so nobody ever knows about them and hope nobody finds out about it? Because if anybody ever does find out about it, guess what? They're going to be infected, right? The second they hear the story, because that doubt is going to be planted in their mind. It's insidious. And so, no, God did not hide Satan away in a dark corner of the universe and hope that we never found out about it. God, in his manifold wisdom, has a plan. And that plan um, is going to defeat Satan and has defeated Satan. And that's what the scriptures show us. And he did this through Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice, it's not done just like, you know, th this did not enter by um, a sword and an army. It, it's, you can't beat it with a sword. You can't beat it with an army. You can't beat sin um, by attacking it in the flesh. It's a principality, okay? It's a power in the spiritual realm. So it has to be fought with the right weapons, okay? So if you try to come at sin, if you try to come at Satan um, using weapons that are carnal or of the flesh of your own making, then you're going to lose, Okay, you have to come at him with the weapons that work. So how do we know? How do we take this out of, you know, mystical land and, and put it into our real life? Well, this is how we find out what wisdom is. Okay, remember, it's going to be done by wisdom. What is God showing through the church? He's showing his manifold wisdom. Okay, now everybody already knows. Again, why doesn't God just come and show his power? Why doesn't he come and just burn everything up? Because he doesn't want to kill everybody. He loves us, right? So the plan requires wisdom and it is through wisdom that we defeat satan if you remember nothing else i want this to stand out in your mind how do you defeat satan how do you take his best shot and get back up at the end of the day like jesus did how do you do this it is not by might it is not by power but it is by my spirit says the Lord. God says he chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong and the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. So it's not going to be through um, human power. It's not going to be through your understanding and your worldly wisdom, but it's going to be through the spirit of God, which God calls the spirit of wisdom. That's the Holy Spirit. Okay. And that wisdom is given to us by Jesus. All right. I'm going to read to you about that wisdom. Um, the spirit of wisdom um, is given to us by Jesus. Ephesians 1.17 says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Okay? And I pray to God that he would give you that spirit right now. I ask him to give you that spirit of wisdom because through that spirit of wisdom, we are going to defeat the enemy and you are going to know God better. Okay, but that spirit of wisdom is the key. And the spirit of wisdom um, teaches you the very first step of defeating Satan. And that is the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Okay, now let's look at how Satan takes you captive. And then we're going to look at how Jesus beat him. Okay, Satan is a deceiver. So you got to realize that the only way you're going to see clearly is if you look to God's wisdom and God's word to tell you what reality is, okay? If you look with your human eyes, you know, you can only see what you can see. And you can't see the spiritual realm. So unless you listen to someone who knows what's going on in reality, in eternity, in the spiritual realm, um, then you're not going to know. You're blind to that, okay? So you have to humble yourself to the spirit of wisdom. You have to humble yourself to God's written word, and you have to trust that this is true over what you understand or what you see. Let's look at how Satan takes you captive, okay? He's going to try to trick you. Understand that. Satan's going to try to get your eyes on the wrong thing and get you to fight with carnal weapons because he knows you can't beat him with carnal weapons because his weapon is a spiritual we weapon. Remember, he didn't bring a sword into the garden. He didn't have to. Just a few words, right? 
So as long as he's got you beaten at the air over here, you're not going to see him sneaking up behind you with his real weapon, which is an infection called sin, okay? He wants to keep you distracted, and he doesn't want you to know what, um, what it really is, what the real power of God is to defeat him. He wants to keep your eyes off of that, okay? And whenever you start to discover that in Scripture, you can guarantee that your flesh is going to kick and scream, okay? Understand, when your flesh starts kicking and screaming, then you're on the right path. <laughs> because the Bible says that your flesh and your spirit are always at war with one another. So you start going down that, the, the path of the spirit, and your flesh is going to rebel. That's a good sign when your flesh starts getting scared because it knows it's seeing that cross in the distance, okay? This is how Satan takes you captive, though. Um, it says in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, um, no, not that one, Romans 6, 16, says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. So you've got on one hand sin, and on the other hand obedience, okay? So understand, disobedience or obedience. Disobedience is sin, okay? So whoever you choose to obey, that's going to be your master. So understand, if you choose to disobey God, you may not think you're a Satanist, but you are following Satan. You may think that you're your own God and you're your own master, but the truth is, you can only, Jesus said, you can only serve one master. You can't serve two masters, okay? You're going to serve one or the other. You were made to serve a master. God created you that way. And whoever you actually obey, that is really your master. That's why Jesus said there are going to be a lot of people on Judgment Day that say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do great things in your name? And he's going to say, I didn't know you. Get away from me. Only those who do the will of my Father belong to me. Okay, so it, it is important who you obey because that person is your master. So how does Satan take you captive? How does he uh, make you his slave? He gets you to disobey God. Okay, because when you're in disobedience to God, you are in obedience to Satan. Because what Satan is telling you to do is rebel against God. That's what he did in the garden. That is his power. If he can get you to mistrust God, okay, and he can get you to listen to his threats, then you are going to obey him as a master and he's going to have his way in your life. And the, um, the amazing thing about it is that all the things that he threatens you with in order to get you to obey him or all the things that he tempts you with, they're all lies, okay? And that's what we're going to see. He uses manipulation in order to get you to disobey God just like he did with Eve. You know, what he told Eve, he's like, did, did God really say you can't eat from any of these trees? God never said that. God gave her every good thing. He, gave, he didn't deny her anything good. But Satan trying to make it sound like God was denying her something good. Well, Eve knew better than that. She said, no, we can, but we just can't eat from that one. And then he starts whittling away at her trust in God by saying that God was trying to keep something good from her. Well, God knows that you'll be just like him, you know, if you eat that. So you're not going to die if you eat it. So he lied to her about what the consequences of eating the, the fruit was of disobedience to God. He told her she's not going to die. When God told her that she would die, and then he told her that God's character wasn't good and she couldn't trust him. So what was the result? Eve, because of her desire for wisdom, because the fruit looked good, right? And because that doubt or fear that she couldn't trust in God to get her what she wanted, to get her what was good, that fear that God was going to keep something from her, right? Because of that, she turned to looking to herself and what she could do, which is reach out. That's iniquity. I'm going to reach out and do what God doesn't want me to do out of my own power. I can do that. I choose to do that. And in getting her to do that, he was able to accomplish his will in her, which all the time was to kill her, to kill the whole human race. That was his plan. Okay? It was insidious. His will for her was that she should die. That was what Satan wanted to accomplish in her life and what he wants to accomplish in your life. That's his plan. So anytime he threatens you, anytime he tries to manipulate you, it's not for the reasons that he says it is, okay? It's because he wants to kill you. Now, what are the threats that Satan uses to keep you in his control? Let's not say Satan, let's say sin, because most of us don't see ourselves as somebody that's being puppeted by Satan, okay? But the truth is, if you are obedient to sin, 
then you are being used by Satan. Let me read you this scripture, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. This is um, an instruction uh, to Timothy. It says, And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Why does it say that, you know, the Lord's servant should not fight against this person? Because it's an understanding of what Satan's plan was all along. He took that person captive to do his will. How does he get us in that place, you guys? He gets us in that place by getting us to be disobedient to God's ways. And the justifications for that, the motivations for that that he uses are fear and desire, specifically the fears and desires of the flesh, temporary things, okay? He wants to get your eyes on what you want in this life, getting what you want in this life, and avoiding pain and avoiding death, which you can't do, okay? But he's going to tell you um, that if you don't do the things your sinful nature tells you to do, if you don't do things by the principles of this world, then you're going to be taken advantage of, then you're going to be hurt, then all these bad things are going to happen to you. This is the threat that he puts forth, okay? And so we, because we're afraid of pain, because we're afraid of death, because we're afraid we're not going to get what we want, we do what our sinful nature demands, okay? But God has a way of setting us free from that. We're going to look at that, okay? Let's look at how Jesus um, overcame this, um, this insidious uh, sin, okay? And understand that it says in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 10, it talks about the wisdom of the cross. It says, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. What I want you guys to see here is that there is a secret wisdom. Remember, that's what God is using us to show, using the church to show the powers and authorities. There's a secret wisdom that will defeat the enemy. And if the enemy understood that wisdom, they would not have crucified Jesus. Okay, I want you to remember that. Then we have the scripture that, um, that I read to you at the beginning that tells us that um, having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. He disarmed Satan. He defeated him. Okay? And the way that he did that was that he took Satan's best shot, he was able to take his best shot and get up again at the end of the day, okay? How was he able to do that? Well, Jesus understood something very important, okay? Let me read to you um, 2 Corinthians 10, um, 3 through 5. Hold on a second. This is going to tell us the weapons that Jesus knew how to use, okay? And these are the weapons we've got to use. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they had divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So Jesus came down as God, okay? And he, uh, he taught us some things that didn't make sense to us because it's not conventional wisdom. So we're going to talk about that, turning the other cheek, okay? I'm going to read that scripture to you. But this scripture grates against our flesh because we're used to this old kingdom. Okay, but you guys have to understand that as long as you're obeying Satan's kingdom, as long as you're obeying the principles of his kingdom, you won't defeat him. Okay, because you'll be fighting um, the symptoms of the sin, but what's actually causing the death in you is sin. Now, most of us, what we're most afraid of is death, right? But when you have the power of God in you, you don't have to be afraid of death because death has no hold on you. The reason that death had a hold on us to begin with, you guys, was because of sin. Sin is the power that Satan actually has over you, okay? So when you defeat sin, that's when Satan is defeated in your life. The nature of sin, however, is insidious because it's infectious. Let me show you this. And this is why we're going to talk about turning the other cheek and how 
got Jesus stopped sin in its tracks and how you can stop sin in its tracks in your life by doing the same things Jesus did. Jesus said this. He set up another principle for you. This is another kingdom he's talking about, totally foreign to the way we do things, okay? He said, you have heard it said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So here, Jesus tells us to do something that's like um, totally actually really scary to us, right? If somebody hits you, then you turn the other cheek, okay? But this is a principle of the wisdom of God, okay? And Jesus showed us that. The Bible says that Jesus was made the wisdom of God for us. That means he was an example. He walked it out for us. Okay? He shows us an example of how to do it by how he lived his life and by how he died on the cross and by how he was raised again. Okay? Jesus did not repay evil for evil. When he was on the cross, they were jeering at him. They were making fun of him. They were saying, hey, if you're really from God, shouldn't God come down and rescue you? You know, the truth of the matter was the Bible says that Jesus could have called down legions of angels to rescue him at any time. But he chose not to. And not only that, he he said, Father, please forgive these people because they don't know what they're doing. OK, now. Most of us. If somebody were to do um, to us what they did to Jesus, we would want to do what? What do you want to do? Somebody spits in your face. What do you want to do? You don't want to turn the other cheek. You want to retaliate. And why do you want to react that way? Because you have this threat hanging over here from this evil king who rules over you through the power of your sinful nature, telling you that if you don't stand up for yourself, then you're going to be taken advantage of. If you don't stand up for yourself, you're going to experience pain. If you don't stand up for yourself, you're not going to get the things you want in this life. If you don't stand up for yourself, you're going to end up taken advantage of to the point where you die. If you don't protect yourself, if you don't look out for number one, nobody's going to do it for you. You see, these are the lies that Satan tells us. But this is the insidious nature of it, you guys. Understand that Satan wants you to lash out at those other people. He wants you to have the attitude of just smashing everything that's evil, smashing everything that hurts you, unlike God. Because he knows that if he can drive a wedge between you and your brother, then he has created a division in God's kingdom and that God's kingdom cannot stand. That's what he thinks. But you see, he didn't have the secret wisdom of God that God has given to us as to how to overcome him. You see, he gives us sight. Satan wants to keep our eyes on these carnal things. These are the bad things that are going to happen to you if you don't take care of yourself, right? He's got this threat hanging over our heads. But what God shows us is that we don't have to be afraid of the temporary things, but we can have an eternal perspective. And that's why he tells us to take up our cross and follow Jesus. That's the wisdom of the cross. I'm going to read to you about the wisdom of the cross. Because this is how we overcome that fear. Now, understand that fear is what keeps us doing the things that hurt us and hurt each other. The works of the flesh, okay, are the works of the sinful nature. You guys need to memorize this in Galatians chapter 5, um, 519 through 21. But it says um, it's sexual immorality impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, that is what is produced in you when somebody sins against you. Have you noticed that? It's infectious. Okay, that's the insidious nature. Satan plants a little bit of gossip. He plants a little fear in someone's heart. But it doesn't just stop with that person, right? 
Because what happens if he can get that person, if he can take somebody captive to do his will, then he brings sin to them and then it produces sin in them and that sin passes through them and causes them to offend somebody else. And then that person who may have been innocent to begin with becomes infected with sin because what does it produce in you when somebody sins against you? Does it produce in you the fruit of the Spirit? Naturally, in your flesh, it's going to produce these things, right? You may have not been a hate hateful person before, but when that person hurts you, what's produced in you? Hatred? Discord? Fits of rage? When somebody tries to put you down and tries to keep you from getting anywhere in the world and tries to keep you from climbing the ladder or making something of yourself, then that makes you want to, to do the same thing. You know, put other people down. Stomp on whoever's head that you have to to climb the ladder of success, right? It produces selfish ambition in you when people do that to you. So you see, you become a conduit of sin. That is the insidious nature of sin. Sin can take somebody who is innocent like Eve, infect them with sin, and then he can use them, take them captive to do his will to you. And see, when they do his will to you, you think if you fight back that you're going to defend yourself, but actually you play right into Satan's hands because when you respond in kind, then you are allowing the same sin to infect you. Satan doesn't care if you, if you lash out at the person who sinned against you. That's exactly what he wants. He wants the hatred to enter your heart. He wants the fear to make residence in you. He wants you to be afraid to lay down your life for other people because as long as you are afraid of laying down your life, as long as you are afraid of taking up a cross, as long as you are afraid of denying yourself the things that you want in this life, as long as you're afraid of that, you will always play right into his hands and you then can be taken captive to do Satan's will. So it's insidious, okay? The power of the cross, the power, the wisdom of the cross, it was a secret. Satan didn't know this because, you see, Satan thought he had this nuclear power called death that nobody could defeat. And the Bible says that, um, it tells a parable about um, some people that were renting out a vineyard and uh, how God sent his servants, you know, and um, uh, the master sent his servants and the, and the people who were renting the vineyard thought, oh, well, we'll just kill the, or we'll just beat up the servants and send it back because don't, they don't want to pay their rent. And then um, God finally sent his son, or the master in the parable sent his son, and the people who were renting the vineyard said, hey, there's the son. He's the, he's the heir. If we kill him, then we'll have the vineyard. See, this is what Satan thought. He thought that if he killed the son, he would win because Jesus was God's anointed king, and all the demons knew that. You know, they always said, hey, you're the son of God. Did you come to, you know, banish us before the time? They all knew that. But what they didn't know is that God had a secret wisdom that was going to defeat them. And that was the wisdom of the cross. Not to fight back against sin and allow um, ourselves to be infected by sin. Jesus was without sin and that is why he did not fight back. It's not by might. It's not by power. Jesus had the power. He could have called down the angels to rescue him. But he submitted himself to God's wisdom and God's will by getting up on that cross and by not allowing the hate to infect him. So this is what happened. Satan came to Jesus. He offered him everything that his sinful um, nature would want in the desert. He said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth if you just bow down to me. And Jesus said, get behind me. Satan, get out of here. He rejected him. And then it says at the end of um, Jesus' life that Satan came back to him that he would be tempting him again because when it was time to lay down his life, that was the ultimate temptation, not to, you know, go with God's wisdom, but again, to protect his own life. And it says that Jesus didn't want, Jesus told God, I really don't want to drink this cup, okay? So he really had to lay down his will in order to do this. So this was a major battle, you guys, okay? But I want you to see um, why Satan wasn't able to beat Jesus, it says in John 14, um, 31, 30 through 31 a, this is the NIV version. I'm also going to read to you the amplified. It says, Jesus said, I will not speak with you much longer for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the father and that I do exactly what my father has commanded me. The world must learn. This is how you beat Satan. Okay. The world must learn. That's what Jesus came to be. He came to be an example of the wisdom of God. 
And he said that, that the prince of this world was coming, but he had nothing in him. But the world had to learn that Jesus obeyed God. So here you have Satan over here who taught the world to disobey God. And then you have Jesus showing that you can't obey God. And what happens if you do? The manifold wisdom of God. We saw that power in the resurrection. The Amplified Version says, I will not talk with you much more for the prince, evil genius, ruler of this world is coming, and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him, and he has no power over me. Okay, Satan thought that he had some kind of power because at least he could kill the Son of God now that he came in the flesh. Woohoo! Right? He thought that because he didn't know the manifold wisdom of God. The Bible says if they would have understood the secret wisdom of God, they would not have crucified him. <laughs> Because they were defeated whenever they crucified the Lord of glory. And this is why. Satan never had any power, you guys, besides sin. And he does not, to this day, have any power besides sin. And in your life, if you trust in Jesus Christ to cleanse you of your sin, and he cleanses you by uh, the power of his word when you obey him, okay, then you become clean. Um, you move into that holiness. And when you mess up, it tells us that, um, that Jesus took the punishment for us too. Okay? He's, it says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised, in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but the circumcision done by Christ having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Jesus has defeated sin totally and completely by taking the punishment that we had to pay because of the fact that we sinned against God and um, by giving us an example of the wisdom of God so that we can do the same thing, the wisdom of the cross. We got Jesus here. He's um, in the garden, okay? And he's at this crossroads. He's already rejected, you know, being, uh, having Satan give him all the kingdoms of the world and being great in this world, which is what most people would want, right? But Jesus had already rejected that. But he had one more test, and that was to lay down his will to the Father and take up that cross and allow himself to be ripped up. And he not only did that, but he did it without hating the people who did it to him, okay? So what he was doing in essence, was he was taking the power of sin. It was coming to him, but it was not being passed through him because he refused to allow it to infect him. You see, many times whenever we retaliate, whenever we don't turn the other cheek, we feel like it's righteous because we were innocent and we were attacked. But you guys, when you do that, you play right into Satan's hands because he wants you to be infected with hate. You see, he was just using that other person as a puppet. And he hated that other person too. He hated that person as much as he hates you. We're all God's children. This is God's kingdom, and it's God and God's kingdom that Satan is fighting against. So as long as he can keep us slashing at one another, we're doing his will. We're doing Satan's will. We're dividing God's kingdom. We are destroying ourselves and our own families. But you see, when we look to the principality of the thing, then we realize that the way that we're going to beat him is by refusing to do what Satan wa wants us to do, which is to retaliate which is to protect ourselves. That is the wisdom of the cross. Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 25. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached, which is the cross, to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Okay, so when, um, whenever... Satan came to Jesus this last time to tempt him. I mean, Jesus said that. He said, the prince of this world is coming to me, right? Right before he was crucified. So there was a battle here. There was a struggle here. One more time. 
But he said, but he finds nothing in me or he has no hold on me. All right. What Jesus was saying here is that he was not infectable. Because he would not respond the way that Satan wanted him to respond. He would not allow hatred to enter into his heart. Not only towards God, mistrust towards God, which Satan tries to do, right? But also towards the other human beings that he came to save. Love, at the end of the day, was what beat the power of sin. You see, the Bible says these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. It says love covers over a multitude of sins. Okay? Faith is trusting in God instead of trusting in Satan. Okay? Turning the other cheek. That's a perfect example. Okay? What does Satan tell you? If somebody smacks you, if somebody beats you down, the Bible says, the Bible says that you should pray for that person, that you should love that person, that you should even, if they're in need, that you should uh, take care of their needs. You know, if you see your enemy in need, that's what God says to do. And do you know why? Because that person is just a slave to sin just like you were. And in the same way that you um, were taken captive to do Satan's will, so were they. Okay? So God, God's wisdom is not the wisdom of this world. But what, do you, what is your reaction when somebody hits you like that? Your first reaction is not love that person. Your first reaction is to listen to the fears that this old master is whispering in your ear. If you do not take care of yourself, do you know what's going to happen to you? So he's a bully. Do you get that? He's a bully. He's, he's hanging over your head, and he's got you in fear. But the way that we defeat that fear is that it's just like with a bully. Bully in the schoolyard. If you turn around and you look him in the face and you say, okay, yeah, I know that if this person hits me, if this person steals from me, I may lose all my money. I may not have anything at the end of the day. If I continually give everything away, I might not have anything Store it up for myself in the future. If we look that reality in the face and we look at him and we are able to say, you know what? It doesn't matter to me because God's will is what needs to be done, not mine. And it's okay if I go through a little pain. It's okay if you hit me in the face, Satan. It's okay. Hit me with your best shot. Because the worst thing that you can do is cause me a little bit of temporary pain in this life. It's caused me not to have my hopes and dreams fulfilled here, which they won't be anyway. And even if they are, it's only for a very short time. That's the worst thing that's going to happen to me. And then I'm going to have everything I ever dreamed of when God gives me my reward in heaven. It's placing our trust in God and not in Satan anymore. Okay? Colossians 2, 9 through 12 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. You have the power, not Satan, okay? And what happens when you turn to the bully and you say, hit me with, the, with your best shot? He may hit you, but if you go down, the scariest thing that can happen to that bully is for you to take his, his toughest punch and then to quietly stand back up again, never having to lash out at all. What can he do with you but run and scream? And that is what Satan will do with you when you learn to employ the secret wisdom of God. Okay? I want to read to you... Um, what God says here about sin, okay, and how it spreads, okay? It says, so that you can understand how Satan is manipulating all of us to make us fight against one another when really what God wants to do is make a kingdom out of us, okay? It says, but if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And then again, Matthew 5:21 through 26. 
It says, you've heard people, uh, that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And then it goes on later to say, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taken you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. What's the point? Satan can infect you, okay, with this sin by having somebody else come and make you angry. But what happens is before God, if you come before God and try to have fellowship with him and try to lay down a gift on God's altar, if you're angry with your brother, you have sinned in your heart. Even if he started it, it doesn't matter. It's caused you to be guilty in God's eyes. And you can't say, you can't do anything um, to affect the guilt of that other person. Okay, that other person is none of your business. What you've got to realize is that God showed you mercy. And he said, if you want God to be merciful to you, then you have to be merciful to other people. That means when they've done something that make, makes um, them indebted to you, when they owe you something, they owe you money or they've harmed you, that you have to forgive them the way that God forgave you. So you don't have a right to hold grudges. You don't have a right to lash out. On the contrary, if you do lash out, you're just playing into Satan's hands because guess what just happened? You became guilty of sin because the Bible says, this says if you're angry with your brother, you commit murder in your heart. And the Bible says that there, there is no murderer um, that, that is a part of the kingdom of God. Anyone who hates his brother and says that he knows God is a liar. Okay? So don't play into Satan's trap. Understand that the power of God is in taking your flesh and putting it on the cross. Now, this is what happens. If you will do this, you guys, and I want you, this week, I want you to think about um, how you have taken matters into your own hands um, when it comes to um, people hurting you or standing up for yourself or trying to vie for position either in your church or in your job or whatever, selfish ambition, all that stuff. I want you guys to think about these people um, that are involved in these stories in your life. And I want you guys to go to God and realize that when you have held resentment against them or when you've lashed out at them or when you've hurt somebody else that you um, have made yourself guilty before God. And what you need to do is not worry about what they did wrong. You need to forgive them and you need to realize that you sinned against God by being angry. So you need to go and make it right with that person. Even if you just have to forgive them and they're not even sorry, just go make it right with that person. Then your relationship with God will not be hindered. And then this is what happens. You are burying yourself with Christ. That's what that scripture just said. You are buried with Christ because you're taking your sinful nature and everything um, that your, your sinful nature wants and you're saying, I don't care. If you have to go through a little bit of pain, sorry flesh, too bad. It's a cross. It's going to hurt. <laughs> okay. You are taking it and you're putting it on that cross. If you're not going to get what you want flesh in this life, that's okay. Because I am here to do the will of God and not to do my own will. And when you take up that cross and you're buried with Christ, the secret manifold wisdom of God is this. That when Satan hits you with his best shot, that you are just going to get back up again. And you're going to do it innocent because you never lashed out. You trusted in God's justice, God's judgment, okay? And understand, when you do that, your justice is no longer in the hands of evil people. Your justice is in the hands of Jesus Christ. And you know that he is going to work everything out for your glory, for the glory of God. And he's going to give you everything. He's going to give you justice at the end of the day. And the best thing he can give you, instead of a dead enemy at your feet, is a living brother or sister that has been transformed by the power of God that they have seen in your life through the love of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you guys to go to God. And if you guys have these situations in your life, I encourage you to write to me and tell me about it. If you don't want me to share it on the air, that's okay. Just let me know. But I just want you guys to really go to God this week and ask him who you need to forgive, um, who, um, who you've been lashing out at, how you have been trying to defend yourself, and ask him what it is you need to do this week 
to put your flesh on a cross so that you can be raised from the dead with Jesus Christ. I love you guys. I'm out of time. Um, I look forward to seeing you next week. Be sure if you are not signed up for our Facebook or our Twitter that you get signed up so that you can get the information about the conference in Dallas in October. Okay, get signed up for that. And until I see you next time, read your Bible and do what it says. <laughs>